We're going to start a minute or two early since I usually go long preaching. (laughs) (laughs) All right, let's all stand. Those of you that are joining us online, we're thrilled that you're with us. And uh, some of you join us after, and that's a blessing, big blessing. And you know, when people give it the thumbs up, (laughs) it sounds so stupid and corny, but it really is an encouragement to know that, that we're being listened to. All right, let's bow in prayer. Father, we're so grateful for your goodness to us. Your mercies are new every morning. We are overwhelmed with a sense of, first of all, how unworthy we are, and yet how gracious you are. And Father, I pray that you would bless us tonight in our gathering, that our worship would be pleasing in your sight, that you would use your word in our hearts. And Father, I pray that as I preach, that I would only preach what your Spirit has revealed in your word, rightly divided, rightly interpreted. I pray that you'd give power to your word, and that you would feed the flock, that you would convict the lost, bring them to the foot of Calvary. And we just ask for your blessing tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Please remain standing. All right, let's turn turn to hymn number 79, To God Be the Glory, hymn 79. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his Son, who yielded his life an atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, Let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. O come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he hath done. O perfect redemption, the purchase of blood, To every believer the promise of God, the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. O come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he has done on the last. Great things he hath taught us, great things he hath done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son. But purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport, when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. O come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Amen. You may be seated. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. We don't have. We have a smaller group tonight. Everybody. Nobody likes that side of the church. Um, our 9:30 a.m. Bible study will begin on October 3rd. I actually will be. We're, we're, next week we'll finish up the right. um, created in His image. Yeah, and that's still September, and then the following. Right. So in September we'll finish up created in His image, right? In, in His image is just called. Oh, in His image. Okay. Well, they're talking about creation, so I, that's why I thought that. <laughs> um, and then on October third, we're going to be studying a study of, on the Sermon on the Mount. Um, and just pray for that. I'm, I've been, been, and actually, it was great. We were away last week um, visiting up in New Hampshire. 
and I got a lot of time to spend on that, preparing that, so that was really good. So it would be a study on the Sermon on the Mount. And also, um, just pray for Skip. Um, you know, if, the, if we're asking people, uh, if anybody's able to or feels led by the Lord, to consider donating a kidney. So um, I think he's, you know, he's, he's been a real trooper, but it's yeah. been going you don't along for it. be a match. Like, if you right. donated a kidney, somehow he benefits. Right. So I, I think when I talked to Skip about this before, um, if you donate a kidney and it's not a match, it doesn't go to him, but it goes into the bank, and then he's able to get one out of the bank, supposedly. I think that's how it works. It sounded like something. Something like that. But you could, but you know, as, this, as the Lord's leading you. Um, let's pray for our offering. Lord, we thank you so much um, that we can be here tonight to worship you. We thank you for the opportunity to give um, our offering as a part of our worship to rely on you, Lord. Um, we just thank you, Lord, for um, the opportunity to worship. And we just do lift up um, Skip especially, Lord, um, waiting for this kidney and going to dialysis three days a week and uh, getting weaker, and it's a real challenge for him. We just, Lord, ask that you would um, raise up that kidney for him, Lord. Again, we thank you so much for this opportunity to worship you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 Sounds like a camp meeting song. College rally. College oh, with, you know, um, it reminded me of Skeet Swats, and we had a guy at Bible Baptist in Westchester that played the, the piano like Jane just did. What a blessing, Jane. That was awesome. I don't know the name of the song. Do you know it, Jane? I don't know the name. I, I know some of We used to sing it in college. And okay, yeah, it sounds like something like Amen. Like a rally song. Was that familiar to anyone else? It was a rally song. That sounds like a rally song. And it sounded happy. Amen. <laughs> Amen. All right, let's take our Bibles and turn to 1 John chapter 2. While you're turning there, I want to thank you folks that prayed for uh, us at the PRBC conference this week in Hanover, Hope Baptist Church. And uh, what a blessing it was. And I had the opportunity to have lunch with Dr. Alan Dunkley. Some of you remember him from um, yes. the creation and um, he and his wife just moved up recently back up into the area. And they're both teaching at Ho Hope Christian School. I think that's what it's called there. And you'd be praying for the Dunkleys. They're trying to raise money. Uh, to. They actually found a house. They're trying to raise money for the down payment. And it's theirs if they can get that down payment by October. So pray for the Dunkleys. Right now, God bless Pastor Alan Harris. 
He's opened his house. They're staying with him. His mother-in-law's, or his mom's staying with him. Uh, it, it, God bless. Man, pray for Pastor Al Harris. That's Dick Harris's son. He has a Christian school. He has people living with him. His mom just fell and broke her shoulder. Pray for Mrs. Harris. He conducted a conference, pastor's conference. He preached at that conference. He had to take his mom to the doctor's while running a Christian school. And, and I don't know how he does it. And I think he's still sane. So uh, you know, pray for Pastor Al Harris. And then also, I want you to be praying. We may get to have a missionary. I'm hoping soon because she's only in the area for a while. But it's a lady I've known for a long time who has a ministry to deaf people. Her name is Marta. And um, I forget how to pronounce her last name, but she is just a very sweet lady. And uh, so just remember that name, Marta, because hopefully she will be having her sometime in the next month or two, I hope, depending on how that works out with scheduling. She's someone that I wanted to have for a while. Uh, she has a very effective ministry with deaf people, and she's just a, a real gem, very godly woman. I want to say she's from San Salvador, but I know I'm going to mess up the country. She's foreign and just a very precious lady. All right, are you in 1 John 2? Did I tell you to turn to 1 John 2? Okay, let's all stand for the reading of God's Word. 1 John chapter 2, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 24 down through verse 28. 1 John chapter 2, verses 24 through 28, and then we'll remain standing for prayer. Let that therefore abide in you, which ye have heard from the beginning. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he hath promised us, even eternal life. These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you. But as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. And now little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. May God bless his word. Please bow with me in prayer. Father, we thank you for, the, for your word. We love your word. It is our necessary food. We pray tonight that you would use your word to feed us, to draw us closer to you, to equip us for what you know will be ahead for us this week. And I pray, Father, that you would help us to just really receive with meekness the engrafted word, help us to be uh, diligent and, and excited and, and just know that you have something for us tonight. And Father, I pray that you would bless the scriptures to equip your people. Bless Bible Baptist Church, Father. We pray for our country. Pray that you'd have mercy on America. I pray, Father, that churches across America would uh, focus on their mission of, of preaching Christ and testifying and showing the love of Christ. I pray, Father, that we would be salt and light in a day that is, seems to be getting darker and darker times that are getting more and more contentious. Help us, Father, to demonstrate that contrast to the world. And Lord, we ask your blessing tonight. We pray for Amelia. And we thank you for this precious lady, Lord. We pray that you would strengthen her just now, just past her halfway point in her treatment, getting very weak. And I pray, Father, that you'd strengthen her and Lord, I thank you for Reuben. I thank you for her husband, her rock. And I pray you bless this couple. And Father, I pray that you would just give her wisdom, um, Lord, that just to know um, how long to keep this pace if, if it, indeed you want her to continue this, this vigorous schedule that she's keeping. And we just pray for extra grace for her. Pray also for John Anderson, Father, that you would bless John. And, um, Lord, when he settles down with his work schedule, meets with the doctor, I pray you just give them wisdom, and as they begin to treat him, that you would also grant him healing. And, Father, I pray for your blessing now upon the word. I pray for Skip also, Lord, that you'd raise up a donor for Skip. 
and that he would very soon be able to get a replacement kidney and, and work on healing, not have to keep going through dialysis. And uh, Lord, again, now we ask your blessing on the word. Help us, Lord, to teach us tonight what it means to abide in you and then help us on a regular basis to abide in you. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. All right, let's take our hymnals once again. We'll turn to him 303. Glory to his name, him 303. the cross where my Savior died, down where for cleansing from sin I cried, there to my heart was the blood applied, glory to his name, glory to his name, glory to his name, there to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. I am so wondrously saved from sin. Jesus so sweetly abides within. There at the cross where he took me in. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied, glory to his name. O precious fountain that saves from sin, I am so glad I have entered in. There Jesus saves me and keeps me clean, glory to his name, glory to his name. Glory to his name, there to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name, on the last. Come to this fountain so rich and sweet, cast thy poor soul at the Savior's feet. Plunge in today and be made complete, glory to his name. Glory to his name, glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied, glory to his name. Amen. Please take your Bibles and turn to 1 John chapter 2. Plunge in today. Plunge in today. What's that mean, plunge in today? Now we're going to talk a little bit about the idea of being in Christ. I want you to look again at 1 John chapter 2 as we're going through. This is message number 21. Just going verse by verse through the epistle of 1 John, uh, written by John the Beloved, the Apostle, one of the inner circle, Peter, James, and John. And tonight, uh, we're going to look at, beginning of verse 24, just to go back and get the context, and uh, look at verses 24 through 28, as we see this theme, this challenge about abiding in Him. Look at verse 24. In fact, I'll read it and then we'll pray. Let, let that therefore abide in you, which ye have heard from the beginning, if... That which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you. Ye shall continue in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he hath promised us, even eternal life. These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you. And ye need not that any man teach you. But as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. May God bless his word. Let's bow together in prayer. Father, thank you for your precious word. 
Teach us tonight what it means to abide in You. And may we avail ourselves of all that we have in Christ as we are in Him. And Father, teach us tonight from the, Your Word. Help us again to understand that You have already given us everything that we need in Christ to live a life of godliness, to endure the trials. And Father, I pray that we would glorify You. Thank You for those that are here tonight. Lord, I pray for those that are traveling. I think of the Camaras. I'm certain others. And then Father, I also pray uh, for many in our church family that are going through various trials. And uh, Lord, I pray that You'd minister to each one of them in a very special way. Um, some not able to come to church because of what's going on in their lives. And I pray that they would just uh, sense and draw near to You during this time. And I pray for Your blessing now as we commit our night to You. In Jesus' name, Amen. So 1 John chapter 2, beginning of verse 24. In fact, we've already looked at verse 27. But in order to get the context and just push us in the right direction, uh, we're going to look at that again. But the challenge tonight is to abide in Jesus Christ. Notice how many times it, it, talk, it uses the phrase abide in Him. Abide, uh, Verse 24, let that abide in you which you've heard from the beginning. Verse 25, this is the promise that He hath promised us. Excuse me, verse 25, this is the promise that He hath promised us, even eternal life. These things, no, I just backed up. It's still verse, actually still verse 24. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye also shall continue in the Son. So we have abide in you, remain in you, continue in the Son. Verse 27, but the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you. Ye need not that any man teach you. The end of verse 27, ye shall abide in him. Then verse 28, abide in Him. So over and over again, we are being told, we are being challenged as believers to abide in Jesus Christ. So what does that mean? Well, let's talk first of all. It's very important that you and I understand in this message because he talks about you have the anointing. You remember that's the same word as the word unction earlier that we read, same Greek word. And it, it teaches us about the ministry of, of the Holy Spirit. Actually, keep your place here to set the, the foundation. I want us to go to John 15 because I think John is building on this, this, this teaching of Jesus in John chapter 15 about abiding in Christ. And I want you to get the full imagery because Jesus identified and likened Himself to a vine. And let's look at John 15, verse 1. John chapter 15 and verse 1, Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Now look at verse 4. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine. <laughs> he just said that twice now. I am the vine. You are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. Now look at verse 6. I want you to keep in mind, this text in John chapter 15, it is important that you understand the context. It is not talking about salvation. It is talking about fellowship. I've talked to so many people over the years that have read this about a branch being purged and tossed into the fire. And all of a sudden, a Christian, you know, especially new Christians sometimes will look at that. Many times people have asked me, Pastor, I just read this verse that really bothers me. Can I lose my salvation? You've got to understand, this is talking about fellowship, not salvation. Look at verse 6. If a, if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. That's the one that really causes some people to struggle. But keep it in context. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. 
so shall you be my disciples. Verse 9. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. That's the challenge. That's what John is teaching us. That's what Jesus taught. Abiding in Christ is simply continuing in His love. And I want to share a quote from Spurgeon. I've shared this before, but I'm, I at least want to say it twice tonight. So if I'm almost done, tell Allah when you hold up your 10-minute thing, if I haven't quoted this verse again, say, quote the verse, okay? <laughs> All right, uh, let me get the quote. What, this is great. Um, Charles Spurgeon made this statement. He said, it is not your hold of Christ that saves you, but his hold of you. I'm not done yet, but I want to repeat that. This, is, this doesn't count as the second time, okay? It is not your hold of Christ that saves you, but his hold of you. Salvation is not by what you bring to Christ, but by what you take from him. Isn't that phenomenal? Again, I'm going to repeat it again later because this is so important. And as we understand this challenge, because John says it over and over again. Jesus said it, abide in me, continue in my love. <sighs> it's up to us. I got to hang on to God. No, that's not what he's saying. Just like the branch. The branch, as long as that branch is in the vine, it's going to get sustenance. And it's going to bear much fruit, which is what we've been ordained to do. Jesus will say later in that text, I've ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. How do you bear fruit? You work real hard. You abide in Christ and allow Him to work through you. So, we have to talk about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And you need to understand something. Most of you probably already know this, but the ministry of the, of the Holy Spirit in the, the Old Testament is a lot different than the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, the Spirit of God's ministry for the people of God uh, was more selective and it was temporary, mainly for service. Uh, in fact, we read um, in uh, the Spirit, in fact, we see this phrase, the Spirit came upon uh, Joshua in Numbers 27, 18. The Spirit came upon David in 1 Samuel 16. And it even came upon Saul in 1 Samuel tap, chapter 10. And then in the book of Judges, we, this, we see the Spirit coming upon various judges like Samson. For, for It was temporary in order to accomplish something for God. And then as soon as that, you know, whatever it was happened, then the Spirit of God would leave. So it came upon them, and then it would leave them uh, just for imp imp empowerment. They came for the Spirit came for specific tasks. And another thing about the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit's ministry, in fact, you might remember Psalm 51. Remember when David sinned with Bathsheba? What did he pray in Psalm 51? Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Christian, you never need to pray that prayer. If you are born again, the Spirit of God comes and dwells in you permanently. Keep that in mind when we read these texts in the New Testament about the ministry of the Spirit and Jesus being in us. His Spirit indwells the believer. And by the way, in the Old Testament, when the Spirit of God would come upon an individual, it was not necessarily a reflection of their spiritual condition. There were some pretty heathen people that the Spirit of God would come upon. I think of Samson. You know, there were, so it was not necessarily a, an indication of the relationship with God. Whereas today, in the New Testament, when the Spirit of God dwells in someone, it is synonymous with being a child of God, with being in a right relationship with God. So keep that in mind. And let's go back now to 1 John chapter 2, if you're not already there. Did you go back to John 15? Well, anyway, go to first, first John chapter 2. So we're going to see three things tonight. The, the presence of Jesus Christ, the possession of Jesus Christ, and the power of Jesus Christ. All in these verses here in 1 John chapter 2. First, the presence of Jesus Christ, verse 24 through 26. Let that therefore abide in you which ye have heard from the beginning. The way this is written in the Greek, it's going back to a specific period of time when they first heard the gospel, the truth. That's what he's referring to. 
If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. Now again, this is not saying that, boy, it's up to us. We've got to really make sure we keep the Holy Spirit inside of us. No. If that which we've heard from the beginning shall remain in you, then we also will continue in the Son and in the Father. That's one of the fruits of the Spirit of God and of believing the Gospel. And this is the promise that He hath promised us, even eternal life. We're going to come back to verse 25 later on in our series. Verse 26, These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. And that just reminds us, remember what John is doing. He's contrasting the Antichrist and his many Antichrists and the Christ and his followers. And he's contrasting that. And, uh, in fact, look at verse 20 earlier on, 1 John 2.20. But you have an unction from the Holy One, and you know all things. I have not run, written unto you because you know not the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. This is a theme of John, talking about truth. In his second epistle, and you don't need to turn there, but in 2 John verse 4, he says this, I rejoice greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth. And then uh, it's 3 John, only one chapter as well, verse 4 says, and you might have heard this, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. So there are two main reasons that believers are not led astray. Number one, they accept the faith. And number two is they remain faithful to it. And that's the fruit of the Holy Spirit in us. In fact, keep in mind, Jesus said this in Mark 13, 22. He said, For false Christs and false prophets shall rise and shall show signs and wonders to seduce, if it were possible, even the elect. If you're born again, you're the elect. Notice what he said. Again, false Christs and false prophets shall arise and shall show signs and wonders to seduce, if it were possible, even the elect. The implication very clearly is that it's not possible. We live in a day where truth is being muddied. And even the general culture of our country, which was so heavily influenced by Bible-believing Christianity... And that's hard for people to believe that grew up like I did in the public school. But if you read primary documents, uh, our founders were so very, so many of them were God-fearing. Uh, and, and many of our laws were based on Scripture. But a recent study, I've cited this recently, different aspects of it. It came out in May of 2021, of this, this year. And... The title of the, the, when the research was done, polling all these people, um, they said America is infected. I, in fact, I put this on the back bulletin board because you, you probably never heard of this. America is infected with moralistic therapeutic deism. They call it MTD. You ever heard of that before? Moralistic therapeutic deism. Let me explain what that is. In other words, they say, the article says, i.e., Watered down, feel good, fake Christianity. So if you say, what is um, moralistic therapeutic deism? It's watered down, feel good, fake Christianity. And, and so let me read to you some of the things that they've discovered about what people believe. 94% of Americans, they say, do not hold to a biblical worldview. In fact, that's why they say MTD, I'm just going to say that moralistic therapeutic deism, is the most popular worldview today in the United States. So here's, here's some of the things they've discovered. Nearly 4 out of 10 adults, 38%, are more likely to embrace elements of, of moralistic therapeutic deism than any other popular worldview, such as biblical theism, secular humanism, postmodernism, nihilism, Marxism and its offshoot critical theory, and Eastern mysticism. So of all these views... This MTD is, is by far the leading belief embraced by people. So what is it? Well, listen to this. 
again, three out of four accept MTD, and yet they still claim to be Christian. So what is MTD? 95% of people that embrace MTD, 95% do not consider obedience to God to be success. 91% do not believe people are born into sin and need salvation through Jesus. 88% said they get most of their moral guidance from outside the Bible. And 76% said good people go to heaven because they are, well, good. In this distorted version of Christianity, the emphasis is on self rather than God and on emotion rather than truth. Those who adopt MTD views believe in innate human goodness and kindness. Now this, where did MTD come from? It actually was first coined in a book that came out in 2005 uh, by Christian Smith and Melinda Lundquist Denton. Uh, The book was called Soul Searching, The Religions and Spiritual Lives of American Teenagers. And here's what most of its adherents, from the book in 2005, most of the adherents of, of MTD believe this. First, it's a belief in God who remains distant from people's lives. Two, people are supposed to be good to each other. Three, the universal universal purpose of life is being happy and feeling good about oneself. There are no moral absolutes. God allows good people into heaven. God places very limited demands on people. Other errant beliefs possessed by a majority of adults who are substantially influenced by MTD include they do not believe in the creation story, they deny the existence of the Holy Spirit, And they believe it is possible to reach complete spiritual maturity. Now get this now. They deny creation, but they deny the existence of the Holy Spirit. And they believe it's possible to to reach complete spiritual maturity in their lifetime. And I submit to you, how can anyone do that outside of Jesus Christ? What we just read, Jesus taught in John chapter 15. Without me, ye can do nothing. You and I left of our own devices, are helpless. And yet the religion of our day has nothing to do with a personal relationship with Jesus Christ or abiding in Him or being sustained by Him. Folks, any human effort that is done towards any kind of morality without God, without Jesus Christ, is going to fall flat on its face. Our challenge then is to realize that we absolutely must have the presence of Jesus Christ in our life. In fact, I want to ask you tonight, are you in Him? Are you in Him? You are either in Adam or you are in Christ. The only two kind of people, according to the Bible, the Bible says in 1 John a little later on, he that, this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. In fact, we just read a verse like that, but it's repeated later in 1 John. And this, this life is in His Son. And then it says, He that has the Son, he that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. So you are, if you are in Jesus, you have the Son. If you don't have the Son, you are still in Adam. That's why Jesus said you had to be born again. Now look at verse 27. But the anointing which ye have received, remember that's the same word that earlier is translated unction, speaks of the Spirit of God's ministry, which ye have received of Him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, you shall abide in Him. I want, you, I want to remind you that the false teachers were trying to seduce, to use John's term, they were trying to seduce the readers, and they, they used, they coined, they used these phrases, anoint and knowledge. They would eventually be called Gnostics. They, didn't, they weren't called, they did have a name for them, I forget what it was early on. That's what Paul's addressing, that's what John is addressing. For example, in the book of Colossians, to the Corinthians, he's addressing an early form of this. But they remember what they did. They saw themselves as possessing an elevated, mystical, secret, special, privileged, in the know about God. And they, they were very arrogant. They looked down on most other people because only a few 
were the chosen and the anointed that were in the know. And, and John and Paul would write and just hit that. And that's what John is doing now. In verse 27, he's telling them, you have the anointing already. You don't need, like he's just refuting this idea from outside. And Paul did the same. Listen to what he said in 2 Corinthians 4, 6. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And in Colossians he added about Jesus Christ in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. See what he was doing there? He's talking to people that had been influenced by this teaching, thinking, oh man, I'm, I'm not one of the, you know, I don't have what it takes like these few elevated, special, the people that have this higher knowledge of God. And, and John and Paul were both writing to say, no, you have the Spirit of God. You've got the anointing. You've got the unction. And that, that, in fact, that's what he means by, you need not that someone else teach you. He's not saying that, that there's no need for teachers. I mean, Ephesians 4.12 and, um, and, and in Corinthians, it's very clear that God gives us the New Testament church and New Testament offices to equip the saints. But the idea is, again, he's, he's targeting this thing and he's saying, with Jesus Christ, each one of us has the ability to know truth just like the Bereans me and my Bible. And again, it's not saying you don't need the local church. God has given us those offices for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, to the edifying of the body of Christ. But he's hitting this, this false teaching very clearly. Listen to what Jesus said. John 14 and verse 16. He's getting ready to leave. And he says, I will pray the Father and He shall give you another comforter that He may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it, receiveth, it seeth Him not, neither knoweth Him. But ye know Him, for He dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. Remember Old Testament? The Spirit of God would come upon to empower. Samson could do some of the things that he did, and then the Spirit of God would leave. Not now. I want you to think about that for a minute. Someday we're going to meet some of those old someday we're going to meet the Old Testament saints. And I imagine they're going to come up to you when they find out you're a New Testament believer. They're going to go, You had the Spirit of God dwelling within you? No way! What was it like? Tell me about it. You know, because all they knew their whole life was it would come and empower them, and then it's gone. Remember, David, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. We can kind of walk around, I'm this little play here, but we can kind of walk around heaven and say, hey, New Testament believer, Spirit of God dwelled in me and didn't leave. No! I, want you, I just want you to get a sense of that, folks, because we have been blessed. We've been very privileged with that. I hope you understand that. It, it, Spirit of God isn't going to leave us. Now, that does mean then that we've got to be very sensitive not to quench the Spirit and not to grieve the Spirit. But wow, what a privilege. Paul said this in Romans 8, 9. Ye are in the flesh. You are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. He's not saying, okay now, check your watch. Is the Spirit of God dwelling in you now? He's saying, if you're saved. If you're saved, the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now if any man, in fact he confirms it. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Jesus said this in John 3, 7, 38. He that believeth on me, as the Scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And then John clarifies. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. Have you believed on Jesus Christ? Then, then you have received the Spirit of God, and he dwells in in, you. in fact, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13 says that when we get saved, we are sealed by the Spirit of promise. Never to lose our salvation. 
I want to remind you, if, tell all this one, I'm going to quote that quote again, okay? It is not your hold of Christ that saves you, but rather His hold of you. Salvation is not by what you bring to Christ, but by what you take from Him. Understand that. Jesus said in John 10, 27, My sheep... In fact, I want you to turn there. John 27. John 10, 27. 10, 27. John chapter 10, verse 27. Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life. And they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my Father's hand. So who's holding who? Is it our hold of Christ or His hold? It's it's God. We are held in the Father's hand. And we have Jesus' assurance that no one can pluck us out of His hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all. And He repeats it. No man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. What a picture of a Father's hand. You know, it is such a precious thing for a child to be able to find assurance by just holding on to the parent's hand. And it only lasts for a little while. But what a precious thing when a little child comes to to hold your hand uh, we've had the privilege, I've talked about my, uh, my friend before, the Pagets. Before, even, vo- even before Mary and I got married, we, um, we had practice kids. Pagets had three daughters, and they were little, and they were precious. And they were like our, like our little kids. And the, the Pagets welcomed us into the family. We were kind of like, you know, Uncle Steve and Aunt Mary. And it was the first time I got to experience whenever we come over and little kids come over. Oh! You know, and they come running up to you. What a blessing. Uh, we get that with my kids too. But I, I remember those times. And it was so awesome just to, to have little kids who look up to you. In fact, I remember the time when their oldest daughter, who we, you know, we were always special for years. And this is something I have to learn that all you parents know that kids don't always stay six years old. And when you come in, there's a time when they stop running up, oh, daddy's home! I wish it wasn't so. And I'll never forget, because we got that kind of reception. Every time we went over to the pageants, then we got married, and they were still like our adopted kids because we didn't have kids for a while. And then I remember one time, I preached at a youth conference. It was a youth retreat. And their daughter, Amy, was there. Sorry, And Mary and I went up, and we saw Amy. She was with a group of her friends. And we're like, Amy! And we go running up. We're all excited. We're expecting to get the normal, oh, look, it's Uncle Steve and Aunt Mary. We're expecting to get that kind of reception. But she was at that age. And all of a sudden, she looked at us. She did not look excited to see us. In fact, she looked embarrassed. And Mary and I were crushed. (laughs) We were crushed. And now we refer to that time as, because we were talking about how disappointed. It's like, and and, you know, you know, as parents, you're all smiling because you know that's what happens. There's a, there's a time, confounded, there's a time when you're no longer like the whole world and now they're more conscious of their friends. And we talk about that, we say, we say, we were adulted (laughs) because that's how it felt. We were adulted, you know, but I remember, and, and this is because of this specialness, I, I love Ray Paget. He's such a dear friend of mine, and and his, he and his dear wife, their relationship to their kids patterned, um, what my relationship would be with my kids. Nothing like daddy's daughters. Nothing like having sons, and to hold your child's hand, to give them assurance. What a blessing! And I still remember. I've shared this before. When Ray Paget was a little older, I mean Amy, his daughter was older, and. They were past now. They were past that stage. They, I guess, had been adulted. 
And one time Amy just reached over and held her dad's hand. And her dad was like a kid in a candy store. Nothing impure about it. It was just so... I still remember him. He was giddy. He's like... And it was precious because it was his little girl. And it was almost like she was saying, Daddy, don't worry. You'll still be my daddy. You know, holding his hand. Now, I expect if my daughters ever listen to this message, sometime in the next few months, they're going to do that to me, probably. (laughs) That might happen. But I want you to take your Bibles, because there is an awesome verse in the Bible. Do you know that God holds our hand? We'll close with this. I want you to take your Bibles and turn to Psalm 73. Psalm 73. Uh, Actually, we have one more verse. I I think a couple minutes, so we'll look at this and just finish, wrap this up. Psalm 73 and verse 23. Remember Psalm 73? Look at verse 23. Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast holden me by my right hand. Isn't that a blessing, folks? Our daddy, our, our Abba, our father still holds our hand. Now go back. One last verse, verse 28. We have to finish this. The power of Jesus Christ. We saw the presence of Jesus Christ. saw the possession of Jesus Christ. Now we see the power. In in verse 28, John says, And now, little children, abide in Him. Abide in Him. Those who, in fact, those who continue to abide in what they've heard show that what they have heard from the beginning abides in them. And they will also abide in the Son and in the Father. Again, it's not our hold of Christ. It's His hold of us. So He says, Now little children, abide in Him, that when He shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before Him at His coming. So as you and I, our challenge, folks, is to to make sure we finish well. I want to finish abiding in Christ. History is filled with people that God used in a mighty way for years, but they didn't finish well. And I'm always mindful of the words of Jesus. He, repeat, he, he says this twice, almost word for word. Mark chapter 8, verse 38, it's also quoted in Luke chapter 9 and verse 26. Jesus said, Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words... In this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also, get a hold of this, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his fathers with the holy, with the holy Father with the holy angels. I'm not sure. I've meditated on that so much. And I've studied that. I know that if you're saved, no one's going to pluck you out of the Father's hand. Maybe this connects with 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Remember that? He shall be saved yet so as by fire. I don't want to be one of those people that my Savior is ashamed of. Yes, saved. Washed in the blood. Still held by the Father's hand. Still dressed in Christ's righteousness. But, He was ashamed of me. I want to finish well. Do you? Close with this. This I really will close. Now, the, the, the source of this, most of the, the people that relate this story say that it came from Car- Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Remember him? Sherlock Holmes? Well, apparently, in fact, the, and this might have actually happened from both of them. Maybe one got the other. Some claim this was Mark Twain. But apparently, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle had a real sense of humor. And he used to like to play, play practical jokes. And one day... He sent a letter to 12 of, or a, a text, a, a telegram. He sent a telegram to 12 of his friends. And all these friends were very influential, upstanding people in society. And he just did this as a joke. He sent this tw- telegram to 12 of his friends. Flee! All has been discovered. And that's it. What? <laughs> How would you like a friend like that? The story goes, all 12 of them fled the country that night. I, again, I don't know, but, you know, I wonder about that. But still, you know, it, if you got a telegram that said, flee, all has been discovered. 
Are you going to be motivated to leave the country? I want to tell you something. Something worse than that's going to happen. Jesus Christ is going to come back maybe today and all will be discovered. And I just don't want my Savior to be ashamed of me. Let's pray. Father, help us. Help us to abide in Christ. Father, thank you that it is not our hold of Christ that, that saves us. It is His hold of, of us, your hold of us. It's not what we bring to Christ that saves us. It's what we take from Him. And Father, I'm so grateful for what we love to call the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. It was finished. And Father, I thank you that we are sanctified by the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And now, Father, as you have given to us all things in Christ, uh, help us. Faithful, we know you will be faithful. You've called us. You will do it. Help us to simply yield to you, to walk in the Spirit so that we do not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Father, help us to abide in you, moment by moment, day by day. Thank you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take our hymn books out. Let's all stand. And we will close in song. All right, let's turn to him 381, Blessed Assurance, him 381. Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending, bring from above, echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day. My story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. On the last, perfect submission, all is at rest. I am my Savior, I'm happy and blessed, watching and waiting, looking above, filled with His goodness, lost in His love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Amen. You're dismissed.